Uh, so, and now, as you know, it is recording. So we would like to say that this is recording session. Uh, this is part of the Erasmus Plus project uh, for capacity building in higher education in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, co-funded by the Erasmus Plus programs of the European Union. We here are presenting Professor Andreas, and Professor Andreas is representing the University of Innsbruck, who our partner is a program country in this project, uh, Armina. And this session is about the exchange knowledge session that we uh, produce every, every week in this semester of the PhD pro Armina PhD program. So welcome, Professor Andreas. I'll keep uh, the floor for you to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning to those who are somewhere else in different time zones. Uh, and thanks, Yad, for introducing me. My name is Andreas Oberbrandacher. It is a rather unfamiliar surname also here, and uh, there's a history uh, to it that I would like to briefly um, well, um, give you some details because it is perhaps also relevant to know where I am in a way coming from also in geographical terms and how this also led me to peace and conflict studies. Actually, I'm a professor of philosophy, a professor of practical philosophy, which sounds almost like a contradiction in terms uh, at the University of Innsbruck. And at the same time, I'm also the director since uh, July of last year of our MA program in peace and conflict studies. And this is one of the main reasons why I'm also involved in this project here. What I did for today's meeting is putting together a few thoughts in the form of slides that could be useful for a discussion on how also reconciliation is linked to terms like forgiving and the unforgivable. But um, before beginning, I have to once again excuse myself because this is going to be a philosophical inquiry. So um, there's a risk and a chance that it's getting abstract from time to time. And that means also perhaps boring from time to time. But nonetheless, I consider this to be quite important also to consider to what extent the philosophical discussion has contributed to, if not conceiving, then at least um, discussing terms like forgiving and the unforgivable, not least with regard to what reconciliation could be. The image that I'm using here as a, a motivating image is one that um, received some attention just a few days ago here in Austria. It is an image that was produced by the um, Chamber of Commerce of the city of Vienna. And it basically says, uh, together, this is our Vienna. It is an image that um, shows a couple um, the husband being a Russian national, the wife being a Ukrainian national. And it basically suggests that, well, I mean, in Vienna, people are able to live together and we should be able also to forgive each other by showing um, um, a binational couple, in this case, relevant also for giving a different image of the war in and against Ukraine. This uh, commercial was almost immediately criticized by the Ukrainian embassy, uh, who said that uh, it lacks any kind of sensibility towards uh, the Ukrainian civilians that are suffering from the war by just showing two happy people that, um, well, present themselves as if there was no war in Ukraine going on. And apart from that, it also argued that what we find here is that a certain form of togetherness is um, commercialized. Uh, and that means also turned into something that can be exchanged in economical terms and at the same time all the violence and all the mourning 
that comes with the war is being repressed. My idea for today's meeting would be that of um, collecting a number of philosophical thoughts and arguments in terms of um, text passages um, that um, well shaped part of the philosophical discussion in the 20th century, especially after the Second World War, and of which I would say that some of these passages might be relevant also for our meetings for at least trying to understand in philosophical terms what um, forgiveness, forgiving, and uh, the unforgivable might mean with regard to reconciliation. I would start, first of all, with a short introduction of myself by giving you some details about where I'm coming from and um, how I am identifying of uh, a person with um, a split personality in a number of respects. And then I would move on to the presentation itself by first of all addressing that what Hannah Arendt has called the burden of irreversibility and the faculty of forgiving. In a second step, I would then build up on her arguments by turning to some thoughts of uh, uh, Yankelevich, who wrote about the logic of comprehension and the madness of forgiving. And last but not least, I would also turn to the question how a certain understanding of a conditional reconciliation is linked to an understanding of an unconditional forgiveness. But at any point, should there be something unclear or should be something that you would like to address immediately, please um, feel free to, to interrupt me. So I, I use this image to introduce myself because it is um, one of the better known images of the region where I'm coming from. It is um, the digital reconstruction of um, a man that died more than 5,000 years ago, uh, the oldest mummy that was found to date called Ötzi, a mummy found in the glaciers of this North Italian Alpine region that um, has actually two official names. It is called Alto Alge, Sutiolo, and on the other hand, Sutiol. It is a region that um, has a number of um, language groups, and in that sense, a certain degree of diversity, a certain degree of diversity that is linked also to some classical um, state conflicts that started um, already during the First World War and that were continued also during the Second World War. This mummy called Ötzi is to be seen in my um, town of birth, which is Bolzano Bozen. It is the northernmost city of Italy, around 100 kilometers from the border to Austria and around another 100 kilometers from the border to Switzerland. So it is a region that is um, in geographical terms um, close and bordering to Switzerland and close and bordering also to Austria. And very much like Switzerland, uh, we have also um, a plurality of languages that are spoken in this region, mainly Italian, but also a strong German dialect, um, a Bavarian dialect, but then also a Romance language like in Switzerland. The reason why I'm starting this self-presentation with um, this oldest mummy is that this mummy is itself presenting a number of uh, ethical issues because um, a whole museum was built around it and the main artifact at display here is the mummy itself. 
And um, in a way, it can be linked to my presentation because um, one could indeed argue what are the reasons why people are putting a corpse, um, the corpse of a person that was, as we know so far, killed on display? Why is this person not being buried? Uh, and what are also the, the ethical reasons that can be given to say that uh, this person should not be buried because we don't consider this to be a proper person, but more like uh, a prehistoric artifact that could be put on display. In uh, many cases, uh, we know that um, museums do in fact have a number of um, collections that are ethically, ethically questionable um, uh, collections of, um, of things that were amassed uh, through violence, um, through acts of dispossession by colonial regimes, uh, but also uh, things that still show um, atrocities in a way. And there have been a number of discussions, uh, for example, in uh, at um, US American universities of what to do with uh, photographs of um, enslaved people. Should they be owned by universities? Such, should such images of violence be put on display? Or do we as an institution also have to ask for forgiveness? for what we did to these people by taking pictures of them and um, by not considering them uh, beings uh, that could actually, um, well, um, withstand our longing to have uh, a photograph taken uh, from them. So in, in, um, in a more, perhaps um, even radical fashion, even this museum brings up the same question. What is the reason that we can put some people that we consider to be prehistoric artifacts uh, on, on display? But um, in this case, it is also an example of why the museum is not even addressing such question because it is the most valuable uh, artifact and the whole museum was built around it. To give you some more impressions of where I'm from and how, let's say, this region is in a way also quite interesting when it comes to peace and conflict studies. It is a region um, on borders, along borders. It is a border region. Um, on the one hand, between, let's say, historical nation states, uh, that of Italy and that of Austria, foremost, but it's also a border region where two totalitarian systems, um, well, mixed and clashed to a certain extent. So this uh, region, this northern province of uh, today's Italy, was in a way both claimed by the National Socialist regime and at the same time also by the fascist uh, Italian uh, um, system. So it is um, one of the regions why, where two totalitarian systems in a way overlapsed and um, also complicated the whole history of totalitarianism because we find uh, elements in our region of uh, the Germanic national socialist totalitarianism and the genocide, genocidal violence that it also unleashed uh, in, in this region. And at the same time, we do also find um, parts of the fascist uh, uh, legacy uh, of um, trying to dominate the region by also uh, eradicating minorities, by forcing people to change their names and by also forbidding uh, their language. In that sense, we do even share part of our history with um, different parts um, of, um, of Libya, because the same architects that were present in our region um, were also the ones responsible for 
constructing um, parts of Tripolis, for example, or we find also that our history in that sense uh, is linked to the history of Eritrea, uh, for example, um, because um, we can indeed argue, and this was an argument that was put forward by Hannah Arendt, that there were at least two forms of, um, of historical imperialism, one of which was um, um, uh, overseas imperialism and imperialism brought elsewhere, especially then also to different parts of the African continent. But we do also find uh, a form of uh, continental imperialism where the same totalitarian regimes, not least Nazi Germany, tried to colonize um, part of, let's say, of Europe, and so did also Italy, which employed part of these uh, colonial techniques also on the region where I'm from. So this region is a region where up until today we find a lot of evidence of the totalitarian past that is very much present in terms of buildings, in terms of monuments. And unlike, let's say, the remnants in Germany and in Austria, this past is still very visible. And so far, there have been only a few efforts to critically come to terms with the meanings invested also in these buildings. One example is uh, this one, again, in my hometown. It is a relief um, created by um, a local artist that collaborated with the, um, with the fascist regime. And in the middle of this uh, former Casa del Fascio, which is the house of uh, fascism in this city, later on it became the, the Department uh, of Finances, uh, you can see Mussolini sitting up on a horse and, um, and below it says credere, obedire, combattere, which basically means uh, believe, uh, obey and uh, fight. And until recently, there has been no critical contextualization or no effort to, let's say, to uh, undo the fascist meaning of, uh, of this relief by confronting it with another uh, meaning. This was done only recently, so a couple of years ago, this changed when um, um, the uh, political parties uh, came to the conclusion that uh, something needs to be done about such monumental forms of fascist architecture. And what they did is they used an expression of Hannah Arendt that she gave in one of her interviews, and they basically put it on top of the relief. So it was an effort of um, not uh, fully dismounting the relief, but to overwrite it, to write something on top of it, so that it uh, becomes uh, or that it gets a new uh, uh, meaning. And. Um, this was um, also acknowledged by the international press as um, a rather good example of how to deal with contentious monuments, um, not simply by uh, dismantling them, not simply by taking them down, but by critically reframing them, by giving them another meaning through um, um, a critical um, form of uh, interrogation. So basically, this is one of the reasons that I, that I also in, in a more biographical fashion, had a, a strong interest in understanding the complexity of uh, social relations by taking into account also the plurality of biographies, but also the conflict that emerge uh, very often in the, in the context of forms of uh, groupings that become uh, polarized. So I did do my studies, first of all, in the field of uh, philosophy. And um, I did then, next to my um, studies in philosophy, also an additional master in peace and conflict studies. 
And so I have this, in a sense, split academic uh, personality uh, that on the one hand, I am um, an academic philosopher, even though I'm still struggling with this term. And at the same time, I'm also a scholar of peace and conflict studies, which means that my approach to peace and conflict studies comes very much, is very much informed also by philosophical debates, uh, but I have um, a, a strong inclination towards understanding and researching conflicts, um, not least in the context also of migration, refuge, um, current European border regimes, uh, and so forth. And um, in the last few years, I uh, have been, um, well, lecturing at a number of, um, of universities across the globe, but uh, mostly in different parts of Asia, mainly in, um, in India, in Nepal, in Thailand or in Taiwan. And I've also been for some time uh, a guest professor in Spain and in the United States. So having said that, I would like to turn now to the topic of our meeting. And once again, uh, I invite you to simply interrupt me when it's getting too boring, too, too abstract, too, too conceptual. Um, and we can have also uh, breaks of discussions um, before I, I continue. Um, I would also like to mention that I'm not, uh, or I wouldn't call myself an expert on reconciliation studies. In fact, I mostly refuse calling myself an expert on anything. Uh, I understand myself more like an amateur, meaning that somebody who has a certain passion for something and that in a way lead, or leads me also to um, the topic of our meeting. Um, from a slightly different angle. So my, my angle is not directly that of reconciliation, but rather I would like to see what can we perhaps learn? What can we perhaps understand if we change the angle slightly to that of uh, forgiveness and what does forgiveness at all mean? In fact, there have been a number of, I would say, quite relevant discussions in the field of philosophy around the concept of forgiveness, most of which are almost immediately linked to situations of violence and warfare of the 20th century. So basically, most of these um, discussions have taken place after the end of the Second World War, even though they have a, a prehistory. Um, one of the to my opinion, very important uh, works that um, can be considered in this respect is the book, uh, The Human Condition by Hannah Arendt, um, a thinker that um, refused the expression philosopher because she argued that academic philosophy is a way of thinking meant for the few and not for the many while she was rather interested in, well, engaging with thinking as an activity that reflects uh, the plurality of our human condition. In this uh, book, um, The Human Condition, she does in fact um, discuss uh, the importance, uh, the faculty of forgiveness uh, repeatedly by explaining how this is linked to her understanding of uh, action. Perhaps you are familiar with the work of Hannah Arendt. Um, if you are, then it is not news to you that in this book, she basically distinguishes between three different types uh, of uh, action. She argues that one type of action is that what we might call labor. She argues that another type of action is that of work and she also argues that work and labor in her understanding are uh, something conceptually quite different even though with the history um, of um, concepts they were eventually also uh, confused and she argues that eventually we also have the action uh, that she calls deeds these deeds, in her um, understanding, are deeds that consist of um, 
on the one hand um, forms of um, interaction with other and at the same time also language of how we speak to each other and she says that in political terms the the highest form of actually acting and the highest expression of human freedom is deeds and not work or labor labor reduces us to an an existence um, of um, of um, not being more than mere working animals uh, of laboring animals and work is um, a form of action that allows us to have a first understanding of the world because we are creating something that remains in this world that is more or less stable but nonetheless the moment we are just let's say creating something um, we are still mute and we are not able to disclose ourselves only through speaking and acting in concert something like a miraculous uh, second birth takes place we are revealing ourselves to each other so a meaningful social interaction uh, um, um, well um, opens us to the world and opens the world to us uh, so she argues in the human condition and this is actually linked to the theme of uh, forgiving, because um, according to Hannah Arendt, what is important to consider in this respect is that um, any kind of deed, meaning any kind of action and any kind of, um, um, uh, of um, talking to each other um, produces, uh, creates certain effects, um, has certain consequences. And we as human beings are um, unable to predict what the consequences of our actions are, what the consequences of the words that we are using are. So she argues that um, these deeds have two major consequences or two major aspects that need to be considered. On the one hand, all deeds are irreversible. So the moment something is done, it cannot simply be undone again. She says that um, if we are building something, if we are creating something, um, um, then this can be undone, it can be destroyed, but human deeds, they last somehow. So if we say something to another person, if, um, if we act in a certain way, uh, then these forms of deeds, uh, the way we speak to each other, they have lasting consequences. So there is something irreversible to it. And moreover, she also argues there is a certain unpredictability. We never know for sure. We can certainly plan um, um, certain deeds. We can certainly choose our words carefully but we do not know what eventually the outcome will be. If, for example, the words that we're using are hurtful for other people or the, the action that we consider to be in everybody's best interest are um, considered to be acts of violence for others. She argues that only a historian can look backward at that what has happened, um, but he can only let's say, confer some meaning to that what has happened, because when he is a historian, he is not himself, let's say, involved in the action itself. Um, this, according to Hannah Arendt, means that the, the our highest form of um, human expression, meaning that we as humans are able to act with each other, that we as humans are able to disclose ourselves to other for words are also those forms of action that make us guilty make us guilty because we never know what the outcome of our actions will be we cannot undo that what has happened um and please excuse me if i if i use some random images to to um, um let's say confer a little bit uh, or at least um um something more concrete to this uh, rather conceptual uh, arguments. We could think, for example, of the 
so-called uh, discovery um, of the Americas, so-called discovery because um, the Americas were never really discovered by uh, uh, European um, adventurers. Uh, the Americas were always already there for the people who lived there uh, already. So the very terminology that it has been discovered reflects already a specific um, point of view, uh, a very specific account uh, of this uh, relation between Europe and uh, the Americas. But one could also argue that um, this very um, deed of discovery from the perspective of um, the European um, voyagers and adventurers was seen as something um, positive. It was seen uh, as, as something that uh, contributed uh, to the advancement of the European civilization. Um, the typical images that we do also have uh, from this kind of, um, um, yeah, quite problematic interaction is that usually it is being depicted as the European coming fully clothed, let's say with the ropes of civilization and the um, different um, um, instruments reflecting science uh, and power. And uh, the people that were discovered um, were represented uh, as a naked woman uh waiting to be please excuse this word penetrated uh by the european uh civilization so what from this point of view from the point of let's say the, the european um adventurers is seen as uh, something very positive obviously had um, um genocidal consequences uh for for many people uh in in the americas and it eventually also uh, led to uh, the new forms of modern uh, slavery. So this is just one of the many examples that we could give that um, certain actions, certain deeds, uh, certain words that were used had consequences um, and had very different consequences depending on um, um, on, on um, which position you were involved in, in this situation. So if we are now able to see and understand this also as acts of violence, uh, it means also that uh, we cannot simply undo what has happened, uh, but nonetheless, we can relate uh, to it. And this is where, according to Hannah Arendt, the question of... Um, of um, forgiveness uh, and of forgiving comes in. Because she argues that these very actions uh, that create all of these problems, because all actions are unpredictable, all actions are, at least to some extent, uh, irreversible. Nonetheless, these actions um, can also be considered as certain faculties or capacities do at least change the meaning of that what has been done. And she argues that, in fact, there are two forms of acting on the irreversibility and the unpredictability. And these ways of acting on, on these aspects uh, of any deed is, on the one hand, the act of forgiving, and on the other hand, the um, the faculty uh, of um, of well giving and keeping uh, promises. So, according to Hannah Arendt, we humans have also specific faculties, specific capacities: the faculty of forgiving and the faculty of um, of, of making and and keeping promises. And both forms of acting um, change uh, the meaning of irreversibility and unpredictability. She argues that the two faculties belong together insofar as one of them, and she thinks of uh, forgiving, serves to undo the deeds of the past, and the other, binding oneself for promises, serves 
to sorry it was too fast serves to set in the ocean um serves to set up in the ocean of uncertainty uh it should actually say serves to set up uh, islands in the ocean of uncertainty, which the future is by definition. So according to Hannah Arendt, um, we humans have the opportunity of um, forgiving and the opportunity of promising and both act on the irreversibility and the unpredictability. Another example of what that could mean is um, Willy Brandt and his uh, famous genuflection in Warsaw as a first public uh, effort to um, ask for forgiveness for the atrocities uh, committed by Nazi Germany. We could obviously um suspect that uh, well this did not just happen accidentally that um, Willy Brandt has thought about it uh, but nonetheless the way it came it came at least to many as a surprise so it was something that was in a way also unexpected something that um, was not in the register of let's say that what people thought would be possible so it changed um, um, the, the, the historical process by giving it a new meaning. All of a sudden, Germany publicly, through Willy Brandt, uh, asked for forgiveness for the deeds committed in the past, meaning all the atrocities. According to Hannah Arendt, and I will just focus on, on, on forgiving and less so on promising, um, it is important that we humans have actually this um, faculty of, um, well, of um, forgiving and of being forgiven, because if we did not have this faculty, then it would mean that forever we would be chained, we would be chained to the um, to the well, to the chain of deeds, meaning there would be no freedom if we were not able to at least in part undo what has happened uh, in the past by giving it a new direction and a new meaning. So according to Hannah Arendt, um, um, forgiving is crucial. Uh, because it is a faculty that allows us to interrupt uh, the chain of events um, by introducing, let's say, a new direction, by giving a new meaning to what has happened in the past. Um, so while in the past certain acts of violence were not even considered to be acts of violence, but, um, well legitimate ways of uh, dominating and even of um, annihilating others to realize that uh, this was utterly wrong and that we committed acts uh, of violence, that these were atrocities and to eventually also ask for forgiveness allows us to start anew and to give a new meaning to the, to the past itself. And she also continues by saying that this reflects already the condition of plurality, because we as human beings can never, that's her argument, forgive ourselves. So it is always something that happens between us. It makes no sense for her to argue that, well, we can forgive ourselves. Forgiveness is something that takes place as a form of interaction between people. And forgiveness also requires the others to be present and to be involved. Another more contemporary example could be that of um, the apology that was um, publicly made in 2008 by the Australian government to the so-called stolen generations. This refers to um, the many uh, Aboriginal children that were violently taken from their uh, families and put into 
foster families um, um, again with the argument that we are integrating um, uh, Aboriginal people by making sure that they are properly educated. Um, this happened up until the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. And um, nowadays it is seen as a major act of violence, as a form of uh, forced abduction. Um, but what makes this, um, let's say, effort to, to, um, to ask um, for forgiveness uh, quite different uh, with respect to that of Willy Brandt is that in this case, it was really planned uh, as part of an election, uh, 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 well, as part of a, a staging of, um, let's say, um, uh, national reconciliation effort. So it was really a, a part of a major strategy of uh, overcoming, let's say, the violence of our past and of identifying a new as being part uh, of Australia. And this, in a way, um, contradicts um, some of the arguments um, of Hannah Arendt, because according to Hannah Arendt, the act of forgiving, for forgiving can never be predicted. So it, um, it is something that um, interrupts uh, the, the chain of uh, actions by introducing something like an almost miraculous event. The moment it is really being calculated and planned, then it is something else, but not uh, an act of uh, forgiveness. It is more like a, a strategy to do something. And as such, it still remains linked, um, let's say, to the chain of events. It is a more instrumental uh, use of the faculty of forgiving for, let's say, the goal of um, uh, national unification. In this respect, she also uh, argues that uh, there's a major difference between uh, forgiveness and vengeance. Because according uh, to her um, argument, uh, vengeance, in a way, is um, a, a circular event. So the moment um, we are engaging in vengeance, we are basically just reacting uh, on that, what has happened, what has happened to us. But it remains uh, uh, a circle of violence of which there is no true escape because any act of violence and any act of vengeance basically turns in, in circles. Only forgiveness in this sense as something unpredictable um, is able to break, to break the cycle of violence by doing something completely unexpected and by, in a way, acting anew as this was the first action at all. I'm sorry, it here should say something different. Um, um, I'm, I'm referring briefly also to the book uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, because it is also quite clear in the context uh, of uh, her book, The Human Condition, that um, in the very background of this book, the atrocities uh, committed uh, by the Nazi regime, and not just by the Nazi regime, uh, informed her arguments. In fact, um, Hannah Arendt participated uh, as a reporter in the trials uh, of Eichmann in Jerusalem, and she wrote uh, her famous book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality uh, of evil. And um, in that sense, uh, the book, The Human Condition and the Banality of Evil might be linked to each other. Um, because according to Hannah Arendt, only that can be actually forgiven, which can also be punished. So the moment we think that there is something that cannot be even punished, then that would amount to something that, according to her argument, is utterly unforgivable. And in a sense, the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime, not least um, Adolf Eichmann, are basically the um, test case for her arguments, because um, the trial of Eichmann uh, did really bring 
the 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 whole system of um, uh, of penal law to its very limit. To what extent is it even possible um, to um, punish somebody in in legal terms for such tremendous atrocities? For atrocities that um, transcend any meaning that was um, previously invested into the system of laws. So in fact, one of the results, one of the historical results also of the Nazi regime and uh, of, the, of the Nuremberg trials was uh, that a new concept, a new legal concept was developed, uh, crimes against humanity. But at that time, um, there was no such concept uh, and it had first to be developed. And in that sense, uh, the trial against Adolf Eichmann put the very um, uh, penal um, 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 system at its very limits uh, because um, it confronted the judicial system with uh, crimes, uh, with atrocities, for which there was, let's say, no um, um, no set of laws that could be easily applied to to punish uh, um, the the perpetrators. And in that sense, um, there is a certain sense uh, also uh, of the argument uh, of Hannah Arendt that when it comes to the Nazi regimes, we are confronted with something that is unforgivable because it evades, uh, let's say, the possibility of being punished uh, because um, it is so tremendous that it appears to us uh, that it is utterly unforgivable. And this brings me now to the second part um, of, um, of my presentation and the effort to link a certain logic of comprehension and the madness of forgiving in the uh, works of uh, Vladimir Yankelevich, who is perhaps the best known, uh, at least philosopher, who engaged with, um, let's say, acts of uh, forgiveness. In fact, he wrote repeatedly about the importance of um, philosophically coming to terms with, um, well, pardoning others or forgiving others. And he did so, for example, in an essay that was uh, published um, in 1965. 20 years after the end uh, of the Second World War. And the reason why he published this uh, essay was that he had um, a certain expectation that um, most people, most people in Europe, and especially most Germans, um, um, most Austrians, had an interest of simply forgetting what has happened. They did not have a strong interest in, let's say, well, being held responsible for what had happened just 20 years ago. Um, so there were, according to his argument, uh, a number of people claiming, well, now the past is past. We should get over it. Um, we should basically forget what has happened. We should have we should start anew and um, don't blame us all the time for something that we cannot be held accountable for because we were not directly uh, linked to the atrocities committed. And um, in this essay, he also famously coined uh, the phrase that um, pardoning or forgiving uh, died in the death camps. Um, he argues that there are, in fact, certain atrocities um, that uh, are so extreme that um, transcend everything that is meaningful to us as human beings, that basically such deeds cannot be pardoned, such deeds cannot be uh, forgiven. And um, he also argues that he, as a 
survivor of this atrocity is also not in the position of actually granting forgiveness uh, to, to those who are not even asking for forgiveness. Because if um, people, well, would be able to grant forgiveness, this would require them to at least be alive. But since all those um, were killed um, by the atrocities committed, then basically um, the survivors are not even qualified uh, to, to grant uh, um, forgiveness because um, they are not the proper victims. He argues also in this respect um, that um, especially in Germany, but also in Austria, we are confronted with a culture of forgetfulness. Um, the people are already celebrating the economic miracle, the economic miracle of the 60s and of the 70s, where they were simply trying to forget what has happened uh, by simply showing to the world how successful we are not least in economic terms, um, the, the success of the automobile industry, not least that of uh, the Volkswagen, it could be an example because the Volkswagen, as is historical known, was um, also heavily involved in the Nazi regime. And um, it was one of those companies that had a tremendous national but also international uh, success in the 15 and in the second uh, 60s that actually built up on let's say forms of expropriation uh, committed by the by the nazi regime so yankelevich is arguing uh, that um, what makes even the whole argument of forgiving of pardoning so problematic when it comes to the Nazi regime is that most Germans, most Austrians simply want to forget what has happened. They are not even asking for our forgiveness because they usually claim, well, we cannot be held responsible. It was uh, some crazy uh, officials, it was Hitler, it was, uh, let's say, um, 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 the regime, uh, but not the ordinary citizens. We ordinary citizens didn't really know uh, what had happened uh, at the time. So, um, but Yankelevich is completely reducing the, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the efforts of forgiving because he argues that on the one hand, um, the perpetrators um, are not even, let's say, realizing uh, how guilty they are. Uh, he argues also that they are, um, just expressing their interest to simply forget what has happened. Um, and uh, he also argues that those who have survived are not even in the position, they're not even able of uh, granting any forgiveness because um, it must be actually the victims themselves who can forgive, but not uh, the survivors. Um, However, at one point, there was um, um, a German uh, school teacher, um, namely Wiat Rebling, that wrote to um, Jankelewicz a very personal letter where he said that even though uh, he was not, let's say, directly responsible because uh, at the time he was a small child for the acts um, uh, committed by the Nazi regime, he nonetheless feels guilty and he accepts the guilt and he would like to ask uh, for forgiveness. And this was um, according also to Yankelevich's response, a very um, important letter because uh, Yankelevich did then actually respond to Raveling with another letter. And he said, this was the first time that I received a letter from a German person asking for forgiveness. And this means a lot to me because until now, no German ever asked for, for forgiveness. Um, Jankelewicz um, concludes uh, this uh, essay uh, by arguing, well, if um, we, we survivors are not able to actually forgive uh, the Germans and the Austrians and all the other perpetrators for what they did, because we are not in a position to do so, and because um, um, they are not even interested in asking us 
for forgiveness, well, what is there then to do? And he says, well, um, we need to acknowledge that even that what is often dismissed as resentment, resentiment, is something that should be valued because he says that this kind of resentment, resentiment, is a way of um, keeping alive memories, the memories of those of those that have perished, of those that were uh, killed. And he argues uh, that it is also a certain form of fidelity towards all the victims. So he says, well, even though we cannot pardon them, the Germans, even though we are not in a position to do so, what we have to do and what we can strangely do is we can have this resentment, which in a way, this grudge, which in a way means also that we try not to forget uh, the victims. We keep the victims alive in our mind. Only a few later, only a few years later on, uh, Vladimir Yankelevich returns uh, to this topic uh, with uh, a major book that was translated also into English as forgiveness, where he tries to approach this uh, topic in more comprehensive terms. And what is interesting about this uh, book is that he creates um, um, or he emphasizes a distinction between um, mm, the excuse and forgiveness. And he says that um, the excuse, the way he understands um, the excuse, it is first of all an intellectual um, attitude. He says that um, when people um, are excusing something or somebody, then this usually means, well, they understand rationally, let's say the, the motives uh, that led to, let's say to this or that deed. But he argues also that this um, effort to understand uh, motives, this um, intellective excuse, as he calls it, is something very, very different from the act of forgiveness. His radical argument here is that uh, an effort to simply excuse somebody or something by trying to understand it uh, means that we are rationalizing it. Uh, we are translating it into a certain, let's say, intellectual framework. But this intellectual framework um, is in a way, um, um, at least in Yankelevich terms, destroying that what needs to be forgiven. Because the moment we comprehend it, the moment we understand it, well, we are suggesting, well, there were reasonable motives. This person couldn't act otherwise because this person felt compelled to do so. So we are creating a number of uh, circumstances and we are acknowledging a, a number of circumstances and saying, well, due to these circumstances, um, unfortunately, these atrocities were committed, but now we are able to understand that this person's um, uh, this regime couldn't act otherwise, and so we can excuse it. In that sense, according to Yankelevich, um, the intellectual effort to excuse something is in a way eradicating that there is even something that needs to be forgiven, because to comprehend and to intellectually try to understand means that we are introducing this atrocity into a chain of events that can be comprehended. But to comprehend means then also to excuse um, simply because we are able to um, fully uh, oversee the different circumstances that have led to this deed. Um, an example perhaps of what um, um, of how radical uh, Yankelevich approach is, is uh, that of um, um, current cases of, uh, of shootings, of mass shootings in the United States, in particular, the, the so-called Charleston church shooting of the year 2015, where some of the um, 
church um, members came together and said that they are well forgiving the perpetrator and um, even though Yankelevich doesn't use any of such examples uh, what he is arguing is that Forgiveness can only take place where there is no excuse, meaning where we cannot rationally comprehend what has happened, where we're not even trying to rationalize it, but we're simply acknowledging that something atrocious, something uh, evil, uh, something extremely evil has happened, according to his wordings. He argues that um, um, in fact, forgiveness is linked to a certain concept of the evil because the evil presupposes really uh, the will to do something evil, whereas the, the excuse and the effort to comprehend is usually suggesting, well, there is no evil uh, because for everything, there is an explanation for everything, there is a motive. And so according to Jan Jankelevich, this intellectual attitude to comprehend and to excuse means to suggest that there is no evil and therefore um, every motive can be comprehended. And this for Yankelevich means no, forgiveness can only take place if there is something which seems to us unexcusable. And um, in that sense, um, the argument of Yankelevich is very radical because it also suggests that um, forgiveness can only take place if um, there is something that cannot be comprehended, if there is something that we do not try to rationalize, but that we take for what it is uh, um, an act of atrocity and an act of extreme evil. Yes, I see a hand raised. <coughs> Please feel free to ask any questions. Or, um, um, yes, have... thank you, Dr. Adriano. Uh, just my question is, uh, we are to understand what, because you mentioned that to forgive is to understand. Here you are referring to empathy. I mean, to put ourselves on the shoes of the other so as we can understand the certain condition that make the, the perpetuator to commit certain crime or uh, bad action. But do you think that it's enough to understand and to explain, to look for, let's say, let's say explanation? Because when we think of explanation, it's sometimes it's worse than, than, than the crime itself. Maybe it's cultural specific to, to our culture because sometimes in our culture, I mean, the Arabic culture or Maghrebian culture, we say, uh, explanation is worse than 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 uh, the the action, uh, or what we say it in Arabic, العذر أقبح من من ال من الفعل من ال من الجريمة. So it's it means to translate it, it's like the explanation. I mean the way you explain. I mean the condition that make you or uh, or push you to do that to do the action, bad bad action is worse than, than, than the crime itself. So sometimes we take into consideration the culture. I mean, here, another factor which affects the, the issue is the culture. Yeah. Uh, thanks yeah. so much. Um, because you actually just summarized uh, the argument of Yankelevich. So this is exactly what Yankelevich is, is saying. So I would even say that there is no um, different uh, difference here or no major difference here between uh, his approach and what you were saying is part of the Arab tradition. Because Yankelevich is exactly saying, um, no, if we try to explain what has happened, uh, the atrocities, uh, then this results in what he calls an excuse. But an excuse is something different from what he calls forgiveness. So he says that we can only forgive that what we cannot explain. So if something so evil uh, has happened or something is so atrocious that we're not even trying to explain it, we're not even trying to rationalize it, we're not even trying to comprehend it, only that can be forgiven. The, the excuse might look similar, but according to Yankelevich, is something very different. He says that the, the moment we are excusing something, we are in a way also saying, well, it has never really taken 
place because we understand it. Uh, we have um, motives for it. We have reasons for it. Uh, and Yankelevich says, but then there is no forgiveness. Forgiveness that can be only if we accept that um, we cannot explain it. We cannot uh, comprehend it. Uh, we cannot rationalize it because it is simply transcending our ways of, of, um, of comprehending what has happened. It is so extreme. So in that sense, I would say that uh, Yankelevich is very much um, saying that what you have um, just um, um, uh, linked uh, to the Arab tradition, in my understanding. Yeah. Does it, does it make sense to you? Yeah, 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 exactly. Just to, because when I think of it, like it, it takes like the, I mean, um, psychological side. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the different conditions and then may, make the, the, the perpetrators commit or do some actions which bring harm to the other. Is that like, it's only psychological side. I mean, certain condition that make him do that. Yeah. But is there another, for example, aspect that I need to take into consideration apart from the psychological side? Because when I'm thinking about understanding, it's empathy. And empathy, it's psychological. It's only psychological. Is there, for example, any other perspective that from which we can understand? Yeah, I'm... I'm... I wouldn't know what Yankelevich would say to empathy, because I think that his understanding of uh, forgiveness does probably not really require empathy, meaning that I think it would be in line with his ways of reasoning to say that we can forgive, but without feeling empathy uh, for the perpetrator. Um, so um, probably he would also say that we can forgive certain uh, acts of violence, but this does not require us to, well, have strong or even positive feelings uh, uh, of empathy uh, for, um, for the perpetrator. Yeah, thank you so much. So he, he would very much kind of keep also the distance probably to the perpetrator, but he would acknowledge that we are able to overcome that what has happened uh, by forgiven by forgiving, but uh, he would not have the longing of um, I don't know have any kind of positive feeling towards the perpetrator by I don't know uh, celebrating um, some kind of togetherness. He would just say we are able to overcome that what has happened uh, by forgiving. Uh, and this forgiving, in a way, requires to take um, the violence as it is, as something that cannot be explained, that cannot be rationalized, because the moment we try to rationalize it, the moment we try to explain it, we turn it into something very different, something that can be excused, but when it is excused, it is not, it's not forgiven. So these two words, forgiving and excusing, sound very similar, and usually they're also used as if they were meaning the same, but Yankelevich tries to argue these are very different concepts. Forgiving is very different from excusing. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, professor, there's another uh, yeah, sure. session, a question on the, on the chat is, uh, from uh, Dr. Abed Rabbo. Is forgiveness based on love and ignoring justice or forgiveness is a Christian religious culture in Islamic culture, it is called al-afu. I mean, forgiveness is not a, an innocent nature, but rather a learned culture. Mm -hmm. How can it be taught in a non-Christian and Muslim in other conflict areas mm -hmm. of the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you again also in this case for these very relevant uh, questions. Um, in fact, I would um, not answer these questions, but touch on these questions in the in the final part uh, of my presentation, uh, where um, there are some arguments linked to the question, where does it all come from? And what do these concepts of uh, forgiving uh, uh, mean in, in a, let's say, in a, in a global world like ours that, um, well, is multi-religious or also in a, in a, to a certain extent also secular, but certainly not just predominantly uh, Christian. 
I, I, so I, I, I would come back to this uh, question, but in the final part of my presentation, uh, also the question of how forgiving as an act is or might be linked to, to justice. Uh, so, so we will leave as, uh, for the last after you finish your lecture and we leave questions after lecture. I think that's also a good idea. What do you think, uh, Professor Andreas? Is that okay? It's um, will really up to you. Um, if you have any kind of uh, very urgent comments or question, we can also have it here. Otherwise, I would continue and uh, and touch on these issues in the very final part. Okay. So, the, so the best is the, we continue the lecture, and after that, we uh, yeah. do the questions. Thank I, you, I Professor. I will try to wrap it up quite quickly. Uh, this final part. So, this final part is called conditional reconciliation and unconditional uh, forgiveness. We could also put uh, a question mark at the very end of it. So this brings us um, to, the, to the third, let's say, body of text that I would like to briefly uh, discuss um, um, because the question of uh, forgiving, forgiveness is also a recurring theme in the writings of another philosopher, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, born in Algeria, uh, became in that sense also a, a French uh, citizen, but um, he also argued that he was never just or never solely a French or European citizen. He also belonged to, let's say, Algeria and to uh, a world that uh, was not or not just uh, 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 Christian. And in fact, um, Jacques Derrida in, in, in the seminar that was translated as on cosmopolitanism and forgiveness is um, also recalling that um, forgiveness, well, is first of all, in his understand, understanding linked uh, to um, all monotheistic uh, or especially Abrahamitic, Abrahamic uh, religions. Um, so to Judaism, the Christianities, and the Islams, as he calls it. So he would say um, it is not just a, a Christian thing. It is uh, a thing that we found in, in different ways, um, part of a um, um, monotheistic experience, of a monotheistic um, way of institutionalizing uh, religious uh, beliefs, uh, but he is also addressing the question, well, what does forgiveness mean then in today's world if we cannot simply uh, assume uh, that, um, let's say, that every person living today is a religious person or that every person um, that believes in something is uh, believing in, in, uh, in, um, in, in just one God, um, etc. So he's basically asking the question, so can we even use um, such a concept if it has been so strongly informed uh, by a specific set of religions, especially also the Christianities, if in today's world, um, well, um, we are addressing a plurality of situations uh, that are not necessarily religious uh, situations or where the people are not necessarily um, believing or praying to the same God, about believing in something different at all, if they are believing in anything at all. So according to him, um, this poses uh, also a problem because it is unclear to what extent forgiveness is at all able to address um, current situations. Um, he also argues that there's the risk that um, this is also a continuation of the efforts to Christianize uh, the world uh, in different means. Now for, let's say, the means of um, uh, having so, some predominant concepts that are being applied to a plurality of situations. But he also argues that there is something quite unique uh, about uh, forgiveness. And he argues uh, that uh, in that sense, uh, forgiveness needs to be differentiated from uh, excuse, regret, amnesty, uh, prescription. And he argues that as a principle, it is something that remains different from any kind of um, legal or even political or economic uh, approach. 
In fact, this uh, text of um, Jacques Derrida is criticizing repeatedly any kind of efforts of using, let's say, um, forgiveness in an instrumental fashion. So something that we have already seen in the works of uh, Hannah Arendt or um, Yankelevich returns also in the writings of, um, of Derrida, because he argues that the moment uh, forgiveness is being put to use in, in an instrumental fashion, for example, in, in the context of a policy of national reconciliation, then it is already something different. It is something that is being staged. Uh, but um, forgiveness is forgiveness only if it, well, cannot be normalized. Uh, so his approach, once again, is very radical because he argues that forgiveness in this conceptual, conceptual sense needs to be exceptional extraordinary, something really impossible because it breaks with the ordinary, with the normal, uh, um, with the possible uh, course of history and it reduce, introduces something um, anew. Uh, well, we could ask ourselves, well, what are uh, current unforgivable events? Probably we could think of some unforgivable uh, events, at least for some people, uh, probably for the United States uh, and for many, 9-11 um, is considered to be something that uh, is unforgivable because it is such uh, uh, an extreme event that they cannot even think of how to forgive such an event. But this for Derrida is where forgiveness at all starts. He argues that Forgiveness uh, can only start where there is something unforgivable. This means that uh, if there is something that we can forgive, then this means to not really be able to forgive because anything that is or that can be forgiven is already something ordinary, is already something normal. He says that actually forgiveness in his very radical sense uh, of arguing requires that there is something that we at the same time call the unforgivable. So he also um, um, criticizes Yankelevich uh, by saying that um, for Yankelevich it was impossible uh, to think of any possible relationship between forgiveness and the unforgivable. Uh, and in that sense, according to Derrida, Yankelevich still thought of um, forgiveness as a sort of transaction. He uses the word economic transaction. But according to Derrida, in a very radical fashion, forgiveness itself demands that there is something that cannot be forgiven. And paradoxically speaking, forgiveness can only take place if there is something that we can actually not forgive. If there was just something that we can easily forgive, then this would not be forgiveness, but it was just something normal, something ordinary. Okay, this has happened, it's bad, it's evil, but it's okay, we forgive it. According to um, Derrida, basically um, the act of forgiving requires that there are crimes against humanity. So the crimes against humanity, according to Derrida's interpretation, are the, re the legal reflection of something that we consider to be unforgivable. And this is precisely the, the crimes against humanity that can be forgiven, but only insofar as they are unforgivable. And this again uh, means that um, it is almost like a divine intervention here. It is so paradoxical uh, that um, forgiveness um, cannot take place in terms of um, something that is calculated, something that is um, instrumentally crafted. It can never become a policy. It can never become uh, something that we demand. It can just happen. 
So I'm, I'm using here the um, example, perhaps some of you know it, a divine intervention as, um, as an effort to, um, I don't know, depict this paradoxical relation that uh, Derrida is thinking about, uh, because in a way he's arguing that forgiveness can take place, but only if it takes the form of a paradoxical intervention um, um, related to that what cannot be forgiven. And this brings me precisely to the question how um, this understanding of forgiveness can be linked uh, to politics uh, or to demands of social justice. In fact, um, um, Jacques Derrida argues that we can only think of it in paradoxical terms. He says that um, there would be no forgiveness if it didn't take concrete forms. So he's not arguing that there should be no effort to, to reconcile or that there should be no effort of having uh, any kind of um, transitional uh, or transformative or restorative justice. He says, no, all of that is very fine and it's also very much needed, but nonetheless, none of these efforts, none of these efforts to reconcile uh, and none of these efforts uh, to um, um, demand social justice can actually be called uh, forgiveness in this full sense of the word. Uh, at the same time, uh, forgiveness itself can only have a meaning if it, it, if it becomes impure, if it is basically put to the test, if it is at least uh, partially realized. <clears throat> so in a way he argues that yes, we need um, forms of social justice. We need a politics of uh, forgiveness. We need also forms of reconciliation. But at the same time, the very, let's say, act of forgiveness remains always heterogeneous, always different to everything that what basically is um, in concrete politics forgiven. So I conclude um, this contribution with a final image um, related to the historical case of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to which uh, Jacques Derrida is repeatedly referring to. And um, he argues that um, to properly understand these acts of reconciliation, we can think of them as, um, as um, paradoxical. Paradoxical because they are combining two heterogeneous elements um, that are nonetheless, according to Derrida, um, linked to each other. They are indissociable, meaning that on the one hand, we have this absolute pure form of forgiveness, of forgiving the unforgivable. And on the other, we have just the impure political, juridical form of um, forgiving this and for that. So none of these forms of, um, of uh, impure um, forgiveness are, are fully um, embodying this uh, pure and absolute forgiveness. But at the same time, there is only forgiveness if it becomes impure, if it, is, if it becomes uh, partial. So this means that in the end, that what is actually forgiven in concrete, political and juridical, in a juridical sense, um, reflects an idea um, of forgiveness uh, that, however, is never fully or um, adequately reflected by the act itself. And for that reason, uh, to forgive remains something very paradoxical. I hope that was not too abstract. If it was, we can certainly return to some of the arguments. Um, that would be, let's say, my contribution, as I mentioned, unfortunately, from a very philosophical point of view. 
uh, but nonetheless, it perhaps helps also to illustrate to what extent philosophy contributed to well discuss notions of um, forgiving, of forgiveness, and also the unforgivable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, very enlightening philosophy of peace. So you actually, it is uh, very hard, hardcore interesting for uh, what we see about uh, professors who really research peace in different aspects and the philosophy of peace. And I think it's very important to understand the forgiveness and its connections to reconciliation and how a philosophy, a philosophy really uh, you know, apply reconciliation in, in thoughts of humanity. So uh, thank you so much. And we open it for questions, but uh, do you like to take a break uh, before we leave? If our, how long do you like to take a break maybe? For if I may just uh, chip in, I was informed before by my by the kindergarten where my daughter is in that I fortunately today I have to pick her up already at four o'clock. The, the okay. kindergarten is just next door. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I have to pick up my daughter at four o'clock already. So we cancel the the coffee break and we go directly to questions. Is that better? And we don't have much time then. We have only thirty minutes with a professor if we can. Uh, or 20 minutes, I guess. I'll give you some time to go to the kindergarten. Okay, so anyone who was uh, Rowan can start. Thank you, Dr. Riyad, and thank you, Professor Andreas. If you can uh, introduce yourself, Sir Andreas will know who you are. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you, but if you have anyone who will ask questions, if you can introduce so professor would know who you are, it'd be very interesting. So my name is Ramon Tahoud, and I am a PhD candidate at the Ermina, uh, doing my PhD on um, digital humanities, how to uh, connect virtual exchange with reconciliation and education. Um, something caught my attention when you were uh, presenting the different views of uh, offering um, pardons and apologies and how genuine can we say apology is if it's only offered when asked for? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the, the last question? Yeah, how genuine can we say an apology is when it's offered only when asked for? Uh, how can anybody say what an apology is um, if, um, sorry, um, I'm still struggling with the question. Uh, how, um, like how genuine can we say this apology is mm -hmm. if we only offer it, if we are asked to do it? If you are only offering it, if we are asked to do it. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, this is, um, I think, first of all, an issue for uh, Yankelevich, um, who argues that uh, um, if, let's say, the other is missing, um, he says that um, um, any kind of, he uses the term uh, pardon in, 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 in French, it has been translated as forgiving, and he argues that um, any act of forgiving reflects uh, a social relation um, where there are uh, two parties uh, involved. Um, and his argument is uh, that um, if the other party is missing from this scene um, because um, this other party is not even realizing uh, that atrocities were committed, um, the other uh, but is not even realizing that something evil has happened or something that should actually be forgiven. According to Yankelevich, at least, it means that there is nothing that we can actually forgive uh, because um, the other party is uh, missing uh, from the scene. Um, so in a way, he's suggesting that um, um, it would be strange. And this is probably what he's alluding to. If all of a sudden um, the, the the Jewish uh, survivors uh, of the Shoah would, um, well, let's say, uh, go to the uh, to the German government and say, well, we we forgive you uh, because, um, well, um, we understand ourselves as being the victims. 
um, and um, you haven't really acknowledged us so far. This, according to Yankulevich, would be strange because very likely then they would say, well, yeah, so what? Because nothing has really happened. So for him, the requirement would really be that um, something needs to be acknowledged uh, first. So that the, um, the people involved in atrocities must acknowledge that atrocities uh, have uh, happened. But that is truly also the, the, the critique of uh, Jacques Derrida later on, because Jacques Derrida criticizes that, um, yes, uh, Yankelevich is uh, expecting uh, the other to be present in terms of some kind of um, symbolic interaction. Well, first, you are um, stating and um, consenting that you are guilty, and only once you have done so, only then can you be forgiven. And Derrida does indeed say, no, this is not radical enough. We need to have this kind of radical asymmetry uh, that uh, an act of forgiveness presupposes that what cannot be forgiven, meaning also that um, a forgiveness can only take place if there is something unforgivable. And in a sense, also nobody there that uh, even asks for forgiveness. Um, but it's 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 um, a tough uh, question when it comes to a concrete um, political and uh, and um, judicial uh, situation, um, because very likely it would be too much to demand um, that um, forgiveness should be granted if at the same time, um, let's say, the, the atrocities are not even being uh, acknowledged. Uh, and this was, in a way, also the process taken by the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions. You need to acknowledge um, the atrocities that have happened, and only then uh, we can uh, speak about a, a pardon. I don't know if that answers, at least in part, your question. Thank you, Professor. We have here uh, Professor Leiner. We would like to say hello for everyone. Yeah. He was in the meeting. So hello. Uh, we have just a five minutes break. I just came to tell me your support and your warm greetings for myself and my apologies that I cannot be today. Normally I would be with you, but it was uh, the same time schedule. So I apologize. And uh, yeah, all the best and very interesting what you are presenting, Derrida and everything. Yeah. Yeah, greetings from Innsbruck. Thank yeah. you. In, in case anybody has an interest, I can also send the, the slides that I have prepared. I don't know if you are sharing the slides for the different presentations. Yeah, we, we can share it. We have a WhatsApp group. Uh, maybe we can add you also to the WhatsApp group where all the Armina people are in, professors and students. So if you send me your, your phone number, I can add you there and then we can okay. share all your PowerPoint okay. there. Sure, yeah. Or send it to me by email. I will send the, I will share it. And if you'd like to be part of the WhatsApp group, of course, we would love to have you. Okay, great. So we have Dr. Mkhimar from uh, Gaza University. Maybe he would like to have a question before. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Mkhimar, you can ask. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yad. And I want to thank Professor Andreas for a very informative and well done uh, uh, presentation on the issue of forgiveness. Uh, Dr. Iyad and uh, Professor uh, Andreas, let me, uh, let me say the following now. I, as, I, as I mentioned, you have done a very, uh, a very uh, nice job in explaining forgive the, condition, the conditionality of, of forgiveness. Um, a friend of mine uh, uh, who used to be uh, an ex-prisoner in Israeli jail, he just wrote a piece just a week ago saying that there is a very well-known saying in Israel, in Hebrew, which says, lo nishkah, lo nislach, which means in English, we will, not forget, we will not forget and we will not forgive. And this person, this Palestinian person, is very much saying that we the Palestinians also we should we should do the same thing as as the Israelis that 
the Israelis will not forget what happened to them in the Holocaust and they will not forgive. And he is very much saying that we the Palestinians who have been suffering on the hands of the Israelis for about 74 years now of, because of the Palestinian Nakba and the Israeli occupation and Israeli uh, 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 injustices against the Palestinian people, uh, uh, we, we, we should do the same thing. Now, I want to ask you, uh, uh, based on your experience, based on your research, do you think that the Israelis uh, or the Jews in general uh, have forgiven uh, the Nazis, for, uh, even though uh, uh, Germany has apologized, the Germans has compensated Israel with millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, uh, do you believe that the Israelis or the Jews have, have forgiven the, the Nazis for the, the Holocaust uh, 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 some 70, 80 years, uh, some, some 80, 80 years ago? And thank you again. That's exactly the point. I think that if I put together, let's say, a presentation that um, draws on the writings of Hannah Arendt, of um, Yankelevich and, and Derrida, it should illustrate that there is an ongoing, to this day, discussion um, uh, among those that have, in one way or another, survived the Shoah. But it should also reflect that there is no such thing, in my opinion, as a, as a common ground, meaning that um, even though the argument of Hannah Arendt, of uh, Yankelevich and Derrida, all three were Jewish, uh, interrelated, uh, they're not immediately the same. Um, so, um, in fact, Hannah Arendt and uh, Yankelevich uh, are struggling very much. and. Um, um, and for at least for Yankelevich, it is quite clear that no, the Shoah cannot be forgiven. Um, the Shoah is the epitome of the unforgivable. And in fact, um, Yankelevich also refused uh, to, to visit Germany or Austria. He refused that his books were even translated uh, in, uh, in German. Uh, um, the, the case is rather different for Derrida. Uh, Derrida does not give um, a specific answer, um, but he argues um, at least that there can be only forgiveness if there is the unforgivable. And the unforgivable is also according to his argument, first of all, uh, any crime against humanity. And the crime against humanity basically resulted also from the atrocities committed by the, the Nazi regime. So for Derrida, there is the paradoxical possibility of such a forgiveness, but it's not necessarily something that uh, Yankelevich or um, Hannah Arendt shared. And it is my understanding as a really outsider, um, um, that uh, this split um, goes also through uh, a number of um, Jewish intellectuals today. Um, but we do indeed find um, a number, I would argue, of uh, Jewish, in part also of Israeli intellectuals who are very much open um, to um, such a form of um, radical forgiveness. I'm thinking on the one hand um, about Judith Butler, for example, who as probably most of you know, is uh, one of the most uh, contested uh, Jewish intellectuals uh, because of the expressed uh, sympathies um, for the BDS movement. But one could also think of um, the Israeli um, philosopher and artist Udi Aloni, who also worked on radical forgiveness. This is certainly not what I would consider to be the majority view um, of, the, of the difficult relation between Israel and Germany or the, the Palestine-Israel conflict. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, there are intellectuals who consider the possibility of a radical understanding of forgiveness. I don't know if it helps to um, 
clarify. So it's not a, a generalizing answer. So I could not possibly say what um, Israel as Israel or the Jewish people are saying, but um, I would at least say that there are opinions, that there are positions that um, explore this possibility. So I think well, you, okay. Just just one 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 last uh, note, uh, if you do, if you allow me, Doctor Yad. Now it, it's good. Uh, you you. I mean, uh, it's totally understandable what you have uh, uh, said, Professor Andreas. So let's just agree on one thing: that uh, reconciliation is one thing, and forgiveness is completely another thing. So maybe the Jews have reconciled the so-called Holocaust with the Germans and Austrians. But forgiveness is completely a different story here that is, is different from reconciliation. I uh, just let me maybe interfere more. Forgiveness is part of reconciliation, not different from reconciliation, might be part of it. What do, what do you, it's like you forgive but never forget. This is how the forgiveness opens the past to learn from the past to develop a better future. This is how I would I would see it. And if you like forgiveness does not mean that you forgive of what the atrocity was done, but you forgive to for never forget and to learn from the past. So this is how it's a healing process. So part of reconciliation is healing and the healing process can happen from forgiveness. So we cannot, maybe it is a different aspect here in, in, applied, in applied philosophy, but when you interact with reconciliation, reconciliation is part of to gain to the reconciliation process is forgiveness. So without forgiveness, not to forgive, like you, the, the Israelis did not forgive the Nazis, they forgive the Germans and they not forgive the Germans and they do not forget. So they learn from the past to develop a better future. So this is like what, what has to forget reconciliation offer. So reconciliation is not forgiveness, of course, and it is different, that's, uh, that's okay, that's yes, but it's part of what will happen, but not to forgive, but to understand how to, to heal. This is also another aspect. So might forgiveness become a healing process that can endure the reconciliation process. So it can be an addition and a supportive for the reconciliation process because you cannot develop reconciliation when there is no healing and there's no, for, no type of forgiveness. So forgiveness has different types as well. And it cannot be just one type that you, you can forgive or not. And forgiveness does not mean forgiveness and forget. So this I uh, just wanted to elaborate. Uh, what do you think of uh, Professor Andreas? I mean, it depends very much on, on the interpretation and on the arguments. I mean, um, Derrida is very radical about this because, yeah, he would say that, um, sure, we need reconciliation and that makes sense for our world. Um, but he would also say that um, what he understands as forgiveness, this radical act of forgiving, um, um, becomes something different the moment it is part of, um, of a policy, the moment it is part of a, of a strategy of reconciliation. Um, it, um, because forgiveness is so heterogeneous, is so, let's say, coming from another world uh, in his uh, understanding that the moment it uh, becomes something earthly, something that we certainly also very much need, it is already something else. Um, um, so he would say that, um, yes, reconciliation, forgiveness are two different things, uh, but forgiveness um, has, in a way, to transform itself. It has to become uh, something. Um, it has to become impure uh, to produce certain effects. Because if we had only, let's say, the purity uh, of forgiveness, then it would make no difference because it's something otherworldly. It's not part of our human experience. But the moment it is part of our human experience, it is already something different, something more down to earth, something impure. Um, so in that sense, I would very much agree with you. Uh, I think um, all three thinkers would say that, yes, some kind of reconciliation has taken place between uh, Germany and Israel, but this kind of reconciliation that has taken place is not the same thing as uh, forgiveness. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Is there any other questions? Maybe, yeah, maybe Abdul Razak can. You have uh, Abdul Razak. You can answer, ask your questions. We have. We yeah, can give uh, you like two minutes, so okay. the Professor Thanks. can leave. Yeah. Thanks again for the, the insightful presentation, Doctor Andrea. So my question is, 
um, what is the rationale beyond, I mean, focusing on forgiveness in this presentation? Is it, am I to understand it's, let's say it's, it's the main pillar in the reconciliation process? Is it the main pillar? I mean, the main pillar, the main uh, cornerstone in the, the process of reconciliation or just because it's random, let's say it, it's done randomly because uh, Hannah focused on, on, on forgiveness, other scholars fo fo focused, uh, focused on uh, forgiveness. Everyone you presented focused on uh, forgiveness. So is that mean, is it the main, I mean, the main pillar for reconciliation? I mean, as a peace, let's say peace uh, seeker, uh, reconciliation practitioner, am I to think or to focus on forgiveness uh, rather than other constituents or ingredients like truth, uh, apology, and uh, other, or just like it's done randomly? No, thank you very much for this very good uh, question. I would say perhaps it's also something very philosophical, um, but I would say that um, why this offers um, stressing the importance of forgiveness has to do with a certain experience of freedom. In a way, they are also suggesting that um, forms of reconciliation and also strategies of reconciliation that very much part of an understanding of necessities. It is necessary that we reconcile to overcome that was happened in the past. So it is already part of a logic. Um, uh, so it is already part of something instrumental. And obviously we can value it for that. Uh, but what the radical, perhaps philosophical longing is here is an experience of freedom, the experience of being able to break with the chain of violent events by giving it a completely different, unexpected turn. And in a way, they're suggesting that, um, well, any kind of reconciliation to really make a difference needs, let's say, this moment of freedom, uh, a, a radical act of forgiveness that transcends, let's say, the cycle of violence. Uh, as long as it becomes just, you know, something instrumental, as long as it's just, you know, um, um, something that we can rationalize, uh, something that we consider to be um, um, necessary or, or useful, we are still stuck in this chain of, um, of events, one following the other, and we only do it because we expect uh, something, well, useful to come out of it. Whereas this radical approach to um, forgiveness would, so would assume there is a possibility here to interfere and to introduce something completely new, and this opens up completely new directions. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I would add just uh, it's, uh, forgiveness is not the main pillar. pillar. Forgiveness is a, uh, not the main pillar of reconciliation. Think of reconciliation as we here in Vienna, we think of reconciliation as a process, a pro an ongoing process. There's no an end for it. So forgiveness can be part maybe of the reconciliation process and to seek forgiveness. This is a different uh, aspect, but it can seek for reconciliation. It uh, seeks for transformation. Thank you, Professor, and I thank everyone. Sorry, who I have to run already. See you yeah. soon. And yeah, thank you. bye. Yeah, excellent. So we have to close the session. And thank you, Professor, for being with us and everyone. I, I thank, thank everyone so for being in this session. Yeah, have a good evening and enjoy your time. Cheers. Thank have you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.